we are going to move to um, panel. a panel. Uh, so we're excited to introduce uh, uh, and moderate the, the systems thinking, modeling, and uh, leadership panel. Um, and again, remember that speaker bios are online on the conference website at www.cornell.systems. So, uh, you know, we'll introduce them, but, but if you want to know more about these folks, you can read about them and see their photos there. Um, <clears throat> and then they'll each give a talk on their subject, uh, which all sort of revolve around a ABA. So you'll be learning more about what Laura's talking about. Uh, and, and then we'll follow up with a moderator and a Q&A session with the, with the folks. Yes, so in this session, we have um, four fantastic students um, who will be sharing on behalf of their cohorts, the culmination of their work for the certificate program. Um, and first we'll have our inaugural year of the cohort uh, started, uh, did a study in the Galapagos as a system and made recommendations. And then our other two uh, cohorts, 2021 and 2022, unfortunately because of COVID, didn't get to take a fancy trip to the Galapagos, but they did get to learn and apply more deeply these ideas uh, and research some of them. So what I'm gonna do is tell you about all four of our speakers very briefly so that we don't have to interrupt in between, and then we'll kick it off to the first speaker. So the four speakers are Will Rose, who was a 2020 graduate of the Institute for Public Affairs, um, and a member of the first uh, cohort of the uh, STML. Uh, he's a great guy. He's got a lot of great experience you can read on. He's an all around good human. We also have Oscar Her Hernandez, who uh, is also a graduate of SEPA in 2021. He's currently an associate at RMI, um, formerly Rocky Mountain Institute. And we've got also from our current cohort, Andrew Wen, who's a fellow at SEPA and graduating this year, he concentrates on social policy. And Ashley, who is also graduating this year um, with a concentration in social policy. Uh, they're all fantastic people, fantastic students, and I'm excited for you to meet them and for them to share our work. So we'll start with our inaugural cohort and Mr. Will LaRose. Thank you so much, Laura. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Yes. All right, excellent. And we see your slides. Perfect, so thanks everyone for coming this morning and your continued interest in systems thinking. So as Laura mentioned, I was part of the inaugural systems thinking, modeling and leadership cohort. And I was one of the lucky ones because we got to execute on the, the actual policy component in the Galapagos Islands. So I'm gonna be discussing some of our work and our research there in this discussion this morning. So when you think about or hear the Galapagos Islands, generally, what's the first thing that comes to mind? If you're like many people, it's probably Darwin, the theory of evolution, maybe it's the blue-footed booby or, or some kind of unique animal endemic to those islands. But very rarely, if ever, do we think about the people who inhabit those islands, the Galapagos Genios themselves. And all too often, we're seeing international headlines that reinforce what our team called the socio-environmental imbalance, where overwhelmingly we see both the international community and the community or the government of the Galapagos focusing on these environmental issues. So given this understanding, our team sought out, sought to understand what brought about this imbalance systemically and how we might use an agent-based approach and systems thinking to influence it. So as I said, we had a year leading up where we studied primarily the theory behind systems thinking, and then we had 10 days of actual field work in the islands. And I think based on some of the questions in the previous panel, this might be helpful to see how we went through the actual process ourselves. So when we conducted our initial DSRP analysis, we found some very interesting findings that were then validated when we were in the field. And so when we talk about agents, primarily we broke it down into three key groups, what we call the globally interested parties or the GIPs, state interested parties or what we refer to as the SIPs and local interested parties or the LIPs. So the global interested parties in this system were the large multinational organizations like the UN, like the World Wildlife Fund, the international media and some large international nonprofits. Now they have immense 
influence and power in this system, but historically it's been very rare and it's been almost entirely focused on environmental issues. So if you recall, you've probably seen in the headlines, there have been one or two pretty significant oil spills off the coast of the Galapagos uh, or, or the instance where they were briefly removed from the UNESCO World Heritage status. Things like this spur action of what we call the global interested parties, but it's never socioeconomic related and it's very um, not, not tied to the reality on the ground often. Next, we have what we call the state interested parties. And these are the, the government itself and large nonprofits and the agents that make up them in positions of powers on the islands. And they often operate at the behest of mainland Ecuador, of which Galapagos is a provincial territory. So interestingly enough, they also are, are influencing this socio-environmental imbalance by trying to maintain the status quo. And what we found is, given the very lucrative status of the Galapagos Islands and the millions of dollars of ecotourism money that they bring in each year, it's in their benefit in the system to maintain that status quo because to be blunt, it often benefits those in power financially. And then finally, we have what we call the local interested parties in the system. And these are your average day-to-day -day residents. These could be local members of uh, local workers of the government. These could be the farmers, fishermen. These are just your average citizens. And unfortunately within this system, they're very, very disorganized. They're very siloed between islands and there's not a lot of uh, capacity or agency or systemic relationships between them. So when we look at the system, if anything needs to change or, or if we wanna address the needs of the local interested parties, we had to find a way to circumnavigate the state interested parties who often unfortunately are corrupt, are trying to suffocate change. And like I said, maintain that status quo. So this is where agent-based approach or caste-based recommendations came into play because we needed to, as I said, have recommendations that had that understanding of the system. And at the local level, it looks something like, something like this, utilizing particularly the R of DSRP of, of relationships, of building that capacity, reducing silos and connecting systems that to that point hadn't been connected. And as it's mentioned, if, if these policy recommendations did not have, did not meet the checks for uh, you know, a complex adaptive system or agent-based approach, they weren't gonna be effective. They weren't adaptive, they weren't incremental, they couldn't be applied at scale and, and they just ultimately would fail. So our team with that understanding of the system had to put those approaches in place to influence the system itself. And so I'm gonna share a couple I know we're short for time here today, but these, these are not by any means exhaustive, but there are a couple that capture the spirit of the types of recommendations that we thought would meet those challenges. So the first, if you recall for those uh, from a US audience, right at the start of the Great Depression in the United States, President Roosevelt founded what was called the Civilian Conservation Corps. And it was a very effective public policy program that took young people who were unemployed and, and had them work, live in groups in the wilderness and work on public works projects. And it was very effective. Um, and we wanted, and we felt like we could replicate this in the Galapagos Islands. So that was one of our key recommendations to start a conservation corps in the Galapagos, particularly targeting a demographic of about 16 to 18 year olds, not only to build leadership and local capacity, but also with the understanding that this would establish that pipeline back to the globally interested parties that I referenced previously. And unless it had that relationship, it, it wouldn't be effective. So that was one of the key relationships that we thought would build that, that, that key relationship between the GIPS and the LIPS and would build capacity at an agent-based level on the ground in the islands. Now, a second one is very similar in establishing, establishing relationships. And it, this was particular, in and amongst the, the park guides on the islands. And when, while we were on the ground, it was very interesting to see that even between two very close geographic islands, they were worlds apart in terms of communication and policy and capturing best practices. So we, we found another recommendation that we thought would be incredibly effective would be connecting those guides, even, even a formal relationship channel, sharing of best practices on a a weekly or monthly basis, 
And then again, establishing a formal connection with a globally interested party so they understand what's happening on the ground and they can use their immense influence and power within the system to affect that. And so that might look like something like uh, setting up a, an advisor at large who can speak with organizations like the World Wildlife Fund or the UN to actually spur change. And then the final would, would be creating a three-legged stool approach where we partner together the global interested parties, the conservation core, and the Galapagos guides. And, and most of the recommendations, as I mentioned, followed this path. So I know I'm short on time here, um, but I would just say, I hope this has enlightened you on, on starting, first using that DSRP analysis, understanding the system, and then using those agent-based approaches or those CAS-based approaches to fundamentally influence the system. And I think these, these principles can be universally applied to whatever, whatever industry or discipline you are in. And you know, having gone through this process in, in the real world, I've seen the, the incredible effect of systems thinking, and I hope anyone listening today understands that and continues to use that in their work. So thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions at the end of this panel. Thanks. We're going to jump to uh, Oscar Hernandez, um, and then we'll we'll have a, a Q and A session moderated at the end of the uh, three speakers. Can you see my screen? Um, yes. Can you hear me also? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, for, for having me and also thank you for uh, to Derek and Laura to make our journey really amazing despite we couldn't go to an exotic island uh, but it was pretty amazing using different tools digital tools um, and I want just to present some some of the key um, insights and, and part of the process that we did uh, during our certificate so so we, we divide uh, our certificate in, in two parts, in two stages. So the first one was this experimental research that I am pretty sure that the, they already described here. But um, I, I want to highlight here that it was a pretty difficult to try to create or explore some experimental research in this area. And I think uh, one of the, uh, let's say, takeaways of the certificate was uh, the process of identifying my own mental model when, when I created any question, survey, or, or approach. So that, that part allows us to understand um, how the DSRP rules are being applied for, for individuals. Um, and the second stage, and that experience was pretty important to what I, I will show in the next slide during our second part, which was uh, taking ABA and try to find what, what, was, what would be the value of applying ABA for, for policy practitioners. And let me put here our starting point during, uh, during our time. So we recognize, of course, that we are in a, in a book award and that the problem here is, is not the speed of the change, it's the, the acceleration. So we are not prepared for that. And the policy practitioners are facing different challenges or different processes. Uh, since they frame the issues, the problem, uh, how they approach the community during the stakeholder engagement, uh, the unstructured data, the evaluation, there are several processes that are being uh, impacted by um, not being able to acknowledge the mental model and discuss uh, openly about that. So we, uh, we, or, or, or hypothesis was that the ABI, ABA sorry, is the book award tool. And to find or to test our hypothesis, we need, we create these three interventions, these three different experiments. One was um, testing how the perspective affect the way in, in which policymakers or policy practitioners uh, make distinction, how they group the different topics, and when we are talking, and, and part of the presentation of, of Will was that, is how you group the different stakeholders, how you group, for example, the, the topics, how you include 
into the uh, different perspective and sometimes conflicting interests. So how you put that together, sorry, that's my stuff here. <laughs> um, so how you put that together and how we can influence that decision to test that there are some bias models using data and some uh, images. So we create that, that experience. And at the same time, the other one was a more, um, so we will teach some uh, policy practitioners and then having some interviews to understand the value of ABA after they, they apply. And finally, a larger scale um, survey, in which we can just give some uh, by side, uh, some infographics and videos about ABA and then ask for the potential value of, of that framework for policy, um, policy practitioners. But when we were designing the different experiments, we began to think, okay, what is, what, what is policy? So first, what is the distinction? What is policy, what is not policy? Uh, who is these policy practitioners or policy makers? Um, what, what is the process of getting a policy? So we, we found several questions that we, did, we couldn't find a, an answer. We reviewed several uh, literature review or whole cohort were made by um, master in public administration students. So we discuss a lot of these. We have several um, workshop and brainstorming session and try to find how this policy, public policy analysis, how we can connect that with the problem solving process or with the decision taking process. So we couldn't find uh, a whole, um, and let's say a compelling and robust answer to this. So what we decided was, okay, let's, let's ask the policymakers, these, these people that we don't know exactly, and learn the kind of tool that they already have. Because we also try to find what are the tools that they are using the policymakers. So each one has two or three in, uh, in the top of the mind, but we didn't have a whole list of, of different tools. So we decide to, sorry, uh, to create two parts survey uh, to just create the baseline. Uh, the first part was about understand the persona. So who is a policymaker? Who is a policy practitioner? Uh, some demographic, the classical demographic, but also some jobs related because we found that the job uh, just shape the kind of tool that they use or, or the kind of approach that they have to take. So we ask for the type of organization, the policy areas, and we focus a lot on the stakeholders. How many stakeholders they have, what kind of stakeholders, uh, the kind of beneficiaries of the policy in which they work. And we try to put a sort of policy pipeline to understand the different step in, in which step they participate and what are the kind of tools that they use in each stage. And also the second part was more about the tool. So we uh, brainstorm during several sessions and, and we came out with, with a list of tools. So we also did a literature review on that. And then we transform that into several attributes. So we try to uh, brainstorm the kind of attribute that we need. And actually that was one of the discussion previous to, to this panel is what is the usability? What is the language? What is the integration of some tools with other tools? Uh, the learning curve, uh, the accessibility, the adaptability of different scenarios or, or a changing world. And of course, how they imp uh, include different uh, perspectives. So with that, we also, since two of our intervention were based on a learning process. So we, we have to teach a new tool to policy practitioner and then ask for the value to uh, evaluate the value of this new tool. So we include some question about the language, the resources, even if they have uh, free resources, YouTube videos, um, if they have a community. So all the potential element that can increase the value of a tool. And of course, some cases and application. Uh, which is, is one of the focus of, of this um, tool. So here are some insights. I, I didn't bring a lot uh, for the time, but of course the most common tool was what, um, oh, one, one of the insights that we have was test the frequency of the use of, of some of these tools. 
but but I, I want just to highlight two things. The most common is SWOT. This is more for a, a more linear work. And the other was Excel was top of mind. Even if we ask for framework, for tool, for method, uh, the people just ask about Excel, that they just model everything on Excel. And they, uh, in some cases, they didn't complement with, with, other, with other framework. And I, I just want to just uh, final thoughts here uh, about not only the insight, but the, the, the journey of discovering this, uh, uh, the, the lack of information, the lack of resources, and how we can, up uh, other cohort can, can approach this problem. So the, the first idea here is that we need to change the paradigm. One of the, uh, business principle is that the structure follow the strategy. And we are in policy, we are so focused on data, but we need to understand that the data should follow the mental model. And part of this experiment and, and this intervention that we design is, is to make evident uh, how mental model can affect how the policy practitioner uh, understand and make sense of, of the data. The second one is that we need a sort of taxonomy of the different tools based on the degree of how they approach. So to facilitate the work of, of policy practitioner. And finally, some new intervention that we just, in, in our report, we just put some, some insights, some ideas for that. But part of the learning process of, of the um, policy practitioner is really important. They say just, 25, less than 25% uh, of them answer that they, in the, they didn't learn anything in the last five years, any, any new tools. So in this changing world, we need to find ways to just update the toolbox of the policy practitioner. And finally, that was the initial objective or, or cohort was to understand or evaluate the effect of mental model and policy problem framework and decision making. And with that, it will finish and looking forward for your question during the section. Thank you. Great, Oscar. Uh, we're we're going to switch to Andrew Wen and Ashley Hawk, who built off of actually what the, uh, Oscar's crew did um, and uh, built built off of that research and found even even more depth and, and findings as a result of the hard work that Oscar's uh, year did. All right. Well, hello, everyone. Um, my colleague Andrew and I are very happy to be presenting our research of policy frameworks on behalf of the entire class of 2022 um, systems thinking mapping and leadership certificate program. So as policy students, we have been exposed to a number of frameworks through our coursework, such as SWOT and cost benefit analysis. However, through our research, we really wanted to develop a better understanding of how those frameworks operate in an actual policy setting and if they're effective in achieving positive outcomes. So our team first conducted a liter literature review based off of the Prisma, Prisma methodology with the search terms policy design theories, policy making tools, and policy frameworks. And we just used our, we searched on two databases, Google Scholar and an online database through the Cornell University Library. And we narrowed down the articles for selection with a search criteria that focused on the front end of policymaking, uh, specifically what frameworks are used when designing policy alternatives and then choosing the alternative to be implemented. And we went through several stages um, of narrowing down our search. So first we took the top 40 articles um, that came up in our search from each database. Um, and then we kind of filtered through the titles to pick um, what were relevant comparing it against the search criteria. Uh, the ones that were then selected, um, we read through the abstracts and then finally chose the ones that would go through the full review. So you can see that policy design theories had nine articles selected. Uh, policy making tools had 17 articles selected and policy frameworks had seven articles selected. So one of the key findings from the literature was that there's a big disconnect between theory and practice. 
we actually found very few efficacy studies on the frameworks that we've discussed a lot through our courses, such as SWOT and cost benefit analysis. Instead, what we found was uh, a number of studies with specific frameworks for very specific problems. And those rigid structures within the frameworks don't translate well between different disciplines. And moreover, it was very unclear how prevalent those frameworks are in practice outside of those specific disciplines. So the question that then naturally arose from that, those, that finding was if policymakers aren't choosing frameworks based off efficacy and research, then how are they choosing the frameworks that they use? So based on our review of the literature, uh, the answer seems to be based on two things, exposure and expedience. Policymakers are choosing what frameworks to use based off of frameworks that they have experience with and what will allow for the easiest implementation instead of basing the choice off of the system in which the policy problem operates. So the picture painted by the literature is policymaking as an ad hoc process with no clear consensus on framework effectiveness. And so based on this um, disconnect, we designed a 12 question survey to send out to policy professionals based off of the following uh, research question. Do policy professionals use frameworks in their decision making processes and are the frameworks perceived to be effective? So we actually had uh, 286 respondents um, from both the nonprofit, public and private sectors in a variety of different fields from education, economics, and environmental policy. And the basic structure of our questions asked if these uh, professionals used frameworks when making decisions, and if the answer was yes, what frameworks did they use? Then regardless of if they used a framework in their decision-making process, we wanted to ask if they found that process, whatever it was, was perceived to be effective. So this then allowed us to filter through and see what frameworks are perceived to be the most effective or if not using a framework is seen as effective. And additionally, we also asked questions about education level, um, sector and policy field to see if there was any relationship between those factors with framework use. And now I'm gonna pass it off to Andrew to discuss the results and findings. Thanks so much, Ashley. So what did we find? Well, for starters, half of our survey professionals did not use a framework at all, which was quite surprising to us. Of those who did use a framework, 53% used cost-benefit analysis, or CBA. 19% used SWOT. And those two are by far the most common frameworks used by professionals. We also found that around 43% of those who did use a framework used one that was not CBA nor SWOT. These other frameworks are extremely varied and often very specific to their field. This was expect expected given the abundance of policy frameworks that we found in our literature review. And other than SWOT or CBA, no other single framework is consistently used by professionals across fields and across sectors. So the natural next question is, what's driving framework use? Well, a regression analysis showed that there seems to be no correlation whatsoever between framework use and whether the professional is in the public or private sector, whether they work locally or nationally, and even their specific policy areas. Perhaps more surprising to us is that there's also no correlation between framework use and the actual perceived effectiveness of the professional's decision-making processes. On average, those who did use a framework and those who didn't use a framework both believe that the decision-making processes are mostly effective. This was the second highest rating they could have picked in the survey. The one result, the one main driver of framework use that was very apparent in our survey was the professional's educational attainment. As shown in this graph, each successive degree is associated with a significant increase in the probability of a professional using a framework. A regression analysis showed that the specific frameworks correlated with educational attainment is, you might have guessed, cost-benefit analysis and SWOT. And also there is no relationship between educational attainment and these kinds of other varied frameworks. So in summary, our research showed that half of our policy professionals don't use a framework to inform their decision-making processes. 
Those who do use a framework are taught to do so through their formal education. And in general, universities are teaching them SWOT and CBA. And everyone finds that their decision-making processes are mostly effective. As systems thinkers, we find that this is concerning. CBA and SWOT are rigid frameworks that are not well designed for complex adaptive systems that policy professionals exist and work in today. While there are many other specific frameworks that work well with specific issues, those are also usually rigid in structure and may not transfer well into other policy areas. This is where we believe systems thinking can come in to fill the gap. In particular, the agent-based approach as a policy decision-making framework can rise to the complexity of the problems that policymakers face today. Without the rigid processes found in other frameworks, ABA can instead help professionals understand the fundamental system structures within the policy issues that they face. This would allow the professionals to build understanding, it will increase the flexibility of their decision-making processes, and ultimately it will help them design policies that actually respond to complex adaptive systems. Moving forward, we would like to research the veracity of this hypothesis, and we would like to test the effectiveness of ABA in a more professional policymaking context. Thanks so much. That was fantastic. Very nice. Um, yeah, it's it's great to see this sort of progression over the course of three years of of, of uh, you know a line that you know we we started out not knowing very much and we started out just attacking a, a really big problem in Galapagos and then we said. Yeah, how do people use models and frameworks? What are they using? And we knew nothing, and it was very difficult to even get construct validity on the questions, as Oscar pointed out. But Oscar's group found a few things uh, that gave us a little bit more. That in the next uh, year, in Andrew and Ashley's group, we were able to um, kind of zero in and find some really fascinating things. So I'm curious, like uh, you mentioned a little bit of it at the end, Andrew, but like. What should we be thinking as a result of, of this path that, um, that, we, that we went on? Yeah, well, I think that, um, you know, coming, coming out of a two-year Master of Public Administration degree, kind of the main tools I have to tackle the problems that I hope to work on, and I wanna work in, you know, government, and I wanna work on these very important issues that face our societies today, I'm kind of thinking of things in terms of strengths and weaknesses, or I'm thinking of things in terms of costs and revenue. And that's just not enough to kind of tackle the problems we are facing today. And in my, in my other classes, you know, I have these very good frameworks to tackle if I wanna study how racism, or if a policy is inherently racist, or if a policy is, um, works in a Medicaid setting, but those are kind of specific fields that I might not work in, and I can't use those frameworks. So I'm really hoping to, take this ABA approach and be able to kind of just understand the problem I work with in order to be able to better connect with the people that I'm trying to serve as well as understand these other frameworks in a better way. Yeah, that's great. So I'd, I'd be curious to hear from Will and Oscar um, as policy students who recently graduated and started new positions. What have you seen regarding the use of systems approaches in your daily work? Yeah, I'll start. I think it's a lot of the problems we see in terms of structural inefficiencies or system inefficiencies. It's it's universal. It's not just the Galapagos Islands or one policy. It can be you know the Army, the State Department, wherever you're working. Um, you can use these tools, and I think it's important not to be for those listening not to be intimidated by the process. If you're new to systems thinking, you follow those steps, you refine your, your model, and you refine your, your your mental model, and then and then use those agent-based approaches. So um, I think, like I said, it's, it's universally applicable and I found it immensely helpful uh, across the private and public sector. Yeah, definitely. And I, I just, I, I use a lot particularly to make the distinction first. Um, I am quite obsessed with, with that. And just let me give you an example. Now I'm working on energy transition. And one of the things that, it was useful for me when I, I began my position was, okay, what, what we understand by energy transition. 
because energy transition is, is not just about just building new solar and eolic facilities, wind facilities. It's about uh, the electrification of the transportation, of the infrastructure, new infrastructure, um, about um, building electrification. So you have different different minutes, and, and then you begin to map the different topics and increase, of course, the complexity and the relationship that you can establish there. And I, I, I found that ABA is amazingly important uh, on topic like energy transition and particularly in just transition. Uh, when, when you include an equity perspective, uh, the complexity and the amount of relationship that you have to map, mm. the, the only tool that you can use is, is this kind of flexible tool that allow, allow you to, to map and understand what, what is happening and what are the, uh, the behaviors of, of the different agents. Yeah, I, lo I love your your focus on distinctions because it's so often the case when people are first introduced to to DSRP, they kind of skip over the D. It's like, oh, th those are things, you know, and it's the S is the part whole and the relationships and oh, perspectives are the best and all that. But the uh, there's a lot of complexity in the Ds that we make, right? And and we often start with the Ds and we just move on. And we've already ruined our analysis because we haven't questioned what are the assumptions in the distinctions that we're making and uh, what what does this term that we're just throwing about what does it mean what what what's part of that term what's not part of that term so I, I find the same thing Oscar that that you know I spend a lot of time in the D's uh, before I even get to anywhere anywhere else. Ashley, uh, kind of a, a two questions for you uh, from the audience. How, how did you identify the 286 individuals for the sample and talk a little bit about Prisma and how that was like why Prisma? And... Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think regarding the first question, um, we're fortunate enough to be working with two individuals in the Cabreras who are very well connected. Um, so we were able to um, hand the survey over to them and they send it out to a platform and we're able to specify kind of um, that we wanted individuals working in uh, policy in some kind of capacity. Um, and so that's how we got the respondents. Um, and then Derek actually introduced us to Prisma as kind of a more um, systematic way to go about doing a literature review. Um, normally it's just kind of a very haphazard process. You put in different search terms and just kind of grab from everywhere um, but Prisma really allowed you know a group of people to kind of um, narrow down our search criteria of what we were looking for especially when you're talking about something as nebulous as policies and policy frameworks um, so Prisma really allowed us um, to uh, kind of make sure we were all on the same page when we were um, conducting our literature review um, and it also allowed it to be a little bit more quantitative in nature um, and focusing on like how we were narrowing down our search criteria. And I mean, you saw we got thousands and thousands of hits just with one search term. Um, and so Prisma really allowed us to kind of think about how we were narrowing it down. And it really showed kind of the discrepancy in how many results you initially got and then how many articles actually kind of fit the topic that we were looking to study more. And this one is to, uh, I guess, the whole panel uh, from the audience. Does the panel think DSRP and ST are as easy to learn, remember, and apply as CBA and SWAT? Uh, if so, then why aren't they taught or more commonly seen? And I'm thinking about the fish tank results, which only took a few minutes to see vast improvement. Feel yeah, I would say I would say you just have to, yeah, you just have to dive in, and I think it's hard when you just look at it theoretically and you're not applying it. You have to go through the entire process, pick up whatever policy problem or or personal problem you want to solve, go through the process from start to finish, and then you'll see how how easy it is or how you know how easy it is to access. I, I think there's the the idea out there that it's difficult, but you know, once you actually go through the entire step-by-step -step process, it'll make more sense to you. But that's what I found when we did the, the culminating exercise in the Galapagos. Yeah, and I um, think, 
Do you want to go, go ahead? Ahead. Okay. Um, I think like the main thing about systems thinking is it's already kind of naturally how people are born to think. But um, I think particularly the education system kind of almost trains you out of not thinking about that, thinking that way. Um, and if you hear more about the Cabrera's research with kindergartners, they're able to pick up these concepts so quickly because it's just innate in how we operate. So I do think um, kind of once you relearn kind of the systems thinking method, it's very easy to pick up. But we are through as you go throughout your education, you're trained more thinking in the strict categorizations, SWOT um, and CBA. Um, but once you kind of have that paradigm shift, um, systems thinking is much more effective. Yeah, I completely agree. And I just uh, would add that part, part of, um, let's say, the, um, that the, the other like SWOT or CBA are, are so common is they, there is already a network, a, a community. So you, you can ask your, your uh, colleagues in, in your work and they, they will show you there are tons of pictures and cases on how you apply. It. So one, one of the key things that we found is that we need to build the community and the cases uh, to facilitate the application. Yeah, and the only thing I would add to what everyone said was like, I think to me, um, the SRP and systems thinking was like learning to ride a bike, you know, um, it was, the concepts are easy to learn, you know, pedal in front of the other, I'm extending the metaphor here, but, um, and, and it's, it's a little like, and when I was first starting, I got to like constantly go back and be like, okay, how am I being methodical? How am I being intentional? But like, after a year of like working with these folks and um, doing some final projects and just using these concepts over and over again, it's like riding a bike where I can just now do it pretty intuitively. Whereas something like SWAT or um, CBA, they're kind of just one thing. It's like a hammer. They can only just do one thing and it's difficult to use in a different con context. And I know that's a mixed metaphor. I'm not sure it completely um, tracks, but it's like, you can just only use a hammer for one thing. Whereas, but it's easy to use, but it, it, you can't really do a lot with it. Whereas if you just kind of learn the SRP and learn the ABA approach, it gets more and more natural. And then I found it a lot, a lot more powerful afterward. Yeah, I think, I think that's a great point, Andrew. I mean, the hammer metaphor is pretty good because it is just like you're just going around and hammering things with, I mean, obviously cost benefit analysis is a, a really useful concept, but it's not, uh, it's not, it's, a, it's like, you know, it's one thing, right? And, uh, and you're not going to really deeply understand complex systems by just, just banging on it with a CBA analysis, so. Uh, we got an audience question for, I, I guess, Will, because uh, it mentions the Galapagos. In the Galapagos study, was there any specific, or sorry, is, was there any recommendation made in regard to the state slash government party to promote a different impact coming from that group? Not sure I understand the question. Are they asking if what did, uh, you you talked about lips, sips, and um, gips, and so I think they're talking about the sips. Were was were there were there recommendations tied to that agent group? No, your, they, they weren't. They were they were at the local level, just given that relationship where there's prevalent corruption and they're trying to suffocate any change at the local level. Because as I said, they want to maintain that status quo. So if we had pre presented a report to the government, they would have just, you know, filed it away and, and carried on. So th these are Asian based recommendations at the, the local, locally interested party level, because that's where, you know, actual change in that system was going to come about. And at the GIP level, right? And the relationship between them. Yeah, exactly right. Uh, Establishing that relationship. Them. Yeah, because yeah. they have immense power and, and influence, as, as we mentioned. And uh, yeah, connecting those two, circumnavigating that state interested party was key. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Um, education takes everything and pulls it apart and makes no connections at all. Bill Mollison. Are there any resources we could use to start our... Oh, this isn't really for the panel. Sorry, we'll answer that one uh, in a second. Um, 
Ashley and Andrew, uh, did any of your findings surprise you? If so, why? And give us your insight as current MPAs who are about to go to, you know, out and uh, change the world. Yeah, well, I think the main surprising result is, um, is that so many people didn't use a framework. Um, and we understand there might be some construct validity going on with the word framework um, and how people are using it. Uh, in our study, we found that people who didn't use a framework had like kind of ad hoc, but more thought out processes that they do things. Maybe that is a framework, maybe that isn't. But um, I think that that kind of just points to there's just a lot of confusion in how we should be approaching problems in the real world. And as you know, just public administration students who really want to go out and like make a change and help the world and be good for people. I think the surprising result is that there's no consensus on how to do this. And there's also no, there's no like kind of great tools to do this other than CBA or SWAT. And I think the CBA and SWAT are fantastic tools for specific problems, but um, I'm surprised that, you know, in, in our 21st century college education degree, we, we're not, we don't have more to give students. And, um, and I feel like that's where systems thinking can really come in. Yeah, definitely. Um, and really the only thing I would add to that um, is kind of goes back to something that Laura touched on in her talk, which is that, um, you know, it's not about solving problems. It's about understanding the system. And I think SWOT and cost benefit analysis um, are great when you kind of have a solution and are analyzing an implementation plan or comparing different policy alternatives. But at the end of the day, they don't help you understand the system. And I think when we, in living in a VUCA world, when so many of our problems are interconnected and a policy intervention in the environment will have huge impacts on you know, economic policy, um, we really need to have more of a focus on understanding the systems. And I think that's where ABA and DSRP really come in. Um, it, it sounds like your your answer, Will, um, brought up another question. So uh, this one is, am I understanding ABA correctly that we need to focus on the local level in order to impact national and global systems? I don't think that's what you were saying, but just for the Galapagos. Yeah, I think each system is different. Um, and in this particular one, I think, yes, at the local level, universally in the Galapagos, that would be effective. Um, but that's not to say another system or policy issue, that's the that's the same. So, I mean, that's a great question, but yeah, in the Galapagos, mm -hmm. focused on those locally interested parties with creating that channel and relationship to the globally interested parties. And, and the reason that you arrived at that as a group was because you interviewed a bunch of people, did a bunch of background research, and, and you essentially found that the state interested parties tended to be wanting to reinforce the status quo, the way things were, which are pretty unsustainable. Yes, exactly is that, right. Is that an accurate statement? Yeah. Yes. All right. Uh, it looks like we can do one more question. Um, so I think this is along the lines of one thing that uh, Andrew just talked about, but uh, possibly just confirming that. Do you believe that if you def if you define framework in quotes differently, you might have had a higher percentage of yes answers? For example, the federal acquisition regulations define independent government cost estimate IGCE as a mandatory requirement for government spending. It is a framework. I definitely think that could be true. Um, in our survey, we kind of let the um, the, part, the respondents kind of just understand framework the way they would use it as the, it informs the decision making processes. But I think to the to that point, it, it was also clear in our research that no matter what framework that they believe you use or didn't, everyone just thought that their decision making processes were mostly effective. There was really no change in perceived effectiveness no matter what they did. And some outlined very long kinds of decision-making processes and was like 
Yep, our decision making processes are mostly effective. And some are just like, I listen to my manager. Yep, it's mostly effective. And I think that is also interesting and um, really points to this idea that maybe we should be thinking more intentionally about the problems that we face. Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, we, we really did have a lot of questions about how we wanted to go about asking about frameworks, given that um, it's not always clear what is meant by framework. But I do think what was um, really clear from the survey results, and this might go back to a little bit to the previous question about what surprised us, was that people just don't intentionally think about how they make decisions. They just kind of do it and don't think about if it's effective or not. They're just like, well, we've been doing it. And so I guess it's effective, um, which is really surprising. And as Andrew mentioned, I think we really kind of need to move away from that and start intentionally thinking about how we want to go about understanding systems. Well, and, and uh, as you and Andrew kind of pointed out to me a few days ago, like the it's like we're not even we're we're getting trained because we're getting trained on SWAT and uh, and and CBE, and because we have those, we use those, and it's very rarely about well, what what is the system? It's very rarely about the system, right? That we're trying to understand. It's about which tool do I have? Which thing was I taught? Uh, and so we use those things because we have them. Um, and, and I think what, where we're trying to flip it is, is to sort of say, well, if the system is a complex adaptive system, maybe we should approach it as such, right? Like it should be about the system. The system should determine how we approach it. Um, and I, I think that really came out of, uh, of this line of research that started three years ago and has ended up with what Andrew and Ashley are presenting for a whole team of folks. Um, so there's, you know, three big teams of folks that were part of this and I, and we're going to take it and keep going with it and, uh, great job. Great to see it all sorted together. It makes so much more sense together rather than disjointed, which ironically is very systemy. Um, but, uh, thank you so much, uh, for all your hard work and, and, uh, for your presentations and thank you to the groups that you're representing. Cause like I said, there's about, you know, each of you are representing about 12 or 15 people. Um, so uh, thank you.